G'day, let's have a coffee together. Here's my coffee, look, woo, there we go. Um, I was tidying up. Yes, I do tidy up sometimes. Not often, but occasionally I tidy up. And I found this, look, 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 look. No, it's not what it says on the cover. What does it say on the cover? Hang on a minute. I'll just give it a bit of a clean because this has been collecting dust for many, many years. Probably, what would it be, 30, oh, going on nearly 40 years, I suppose. Almost 40 years since I uh, was playing around with this stuff. And no, it's not a TRS-80 Model 2 manual, even though it says so on the front. Here we go, look at that, isn't that lovely? It stood the test of time well, hasn't it? Look, beautiful vinyl. Ooh, I don't make it like that anymore. Right, so, it's a ring binder with TRS-80 Model 2 on the front, and it's not, as I said, it's not a TRS-80 Model 2 folder. Now, a lot of people have asked me, what did you do before you started doing YouTube stuff? And I think some of you know that I was an electronics engineer. Uh, way back in my the first part of my career, after I uh, finished my tuition, I was an electronics engineer. I designed and built and serviced and um, did all sorts of stuff with electronics. Great fun back then. This is the pre-digital era. We're talking about mm, the early to mid-1970s, before microcontrollers, microprocessors were even thought of. And so I would design a circuit from scratch, build up a prototype, sometimes build a few prototypes, then we'd commercialize it. Sometimes we'd make a lot of money, sometimes we wouldn't. But it was a great, great um, time to be in electronics because there was so much excitement. Anyway, I'm, after that, electronics, microcontrollers came along, microprocessors came along, and I actually got into programming because some of the work I was doing, it wasn't that much fun, to be honest. You know, crawling under big heavy machinery in the middle of the night to fix up faulty relays and faulty motors and faulty drive controllers it was some of the work I was doing, and I just didn't like doing that in the middle of winter. So I thought, hmm. These microprocessor things, they seem to be a lot of fun. I built a few microprocessors. I'll show you some of the early stuff I was working with in another video. But I thought, maybe I should get into software because you can do that in the comfort and luxury of an office with heating and ventilation and comfy chairs, not like crawling under a big machine in the middle of the night. So I thought, great, I'll learn to program. And I did, and I developed software for many years. I had my own company, actually a couple of companies, developing software, selling it. I did very well out of that, actually. That was before I got into the internet. We'll talk about the internet in another video, but uh, way back in the 80s, early 80s, when I was developing software, I came up with a couple of really, really popular products, certainly here in New Zealand. And in this folder is some of the documentation for those projects. Let's open it up, let the cobwebs fly out. Oh, oh, oh. So what have I got here? Um, oh yes, here we go. Just let me refocus the camera. Now in the early 80s, Epson, everyone knows the name Epson, it's a Japanese manufacturer. They were well known for printers and a few other things. They bought out a, a 8-bit microcomputer called the Epson QX10 and it came with a version of CPM, an operating system, you know, like we have Windows today and we have Linux today. Well, this was CPM for those of you who weren't alive then. And CPM was a really simple basic operating system, but it enabled computer manufacturers to get an OS on their computer and really to port to run software on multiple platforms. So the Epson QX10 came with a version of the CPM operating system, version 2.2, and it was crap. It was really poorly written to the effect that I think they only had 160 k bytes of storage per disk or something silly like that. It was a ridiculously low amount of disk storage and it had awful cryptic standard uh, CPM error messages and Really, it detracted from what was a really schmick machine. I mean, this machine had up to 256k bytes of RAM, which was unheard of for an 8-bit computer back then. It had high-resolution 640 by 480 graphics with a, a dedicated graphics controller chip. This was really futuristic stuff back in the early 1980s. It was way ahead of its time, but it was ankle-tapped by the operating system. So I sat down and I rewrote the BIOS, which is the machine-dependent part of the Epson QX10 CPM. And I added all sorts of cool features like background print spooling. Now, as I say, we're going back a long time now. Way back, what was it, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the computer of the computers of the day had didn't have multitasking operating systems. There was none of this multitasking operating systems we have now, you know, where you can do one thing and something happens in the background and you know you can run four or five programs at once. Nope, they were single tasking machines. So if you had a word processor and you typed up a letter or a document or a book even, and you decided you want to print that book, then you couldn't use your computer until the printing had finished. There were no print spoolers. It was just every single character was sent to the printer and then the next one and the next one, and the computer was busy fetching the characters and sending them to 
the printer. There was, once you started printing, you had to walk away and let it finish printing before you could use your computer. So I decided, hey, this isn't good enough. And I wrote, or built into the operating system, a background print spooler. So you could set your, or say print, and immediately the computer was then free and available to do other things while it was printing in the background. Fantastic, it was like unheard of stuff back then. So this operating system I wrote, I sold a bundle of them, I think thousands of them, um, thousands of copies in New Zealand. That was a lot of stuff. Um, probably if every machine that went out, eventually people bought this operating system because it just added so much extra stuff. We used to use a word processor called WordStar. It was one of the very first word processors and it was a really good word processor, but it was kind of cryptic. You know, if you wanted to move to the right, you had to use control and a character key, move to the left to control the character. So it was all control keys to do simple stuff like move blocks of text, mark blocks of text, all that sort of stuff. So I basically modified this operating system so you could program the function keys, because otherwise the function keys couldn't be programmed. So you had all these function keys on this computer, you couldn't use them, because they were useless. So I did a lot of work and this turned it into a really schmick, really flashy word processing, processing setup. And in the end, I actually licensed this operating system to various vendors around the country. Very, very popular it was. Um, so there we go. And this was this is basically just some of the user documentation for this particular thing. I, I upped the disk storage to 380k from a previously, I think it was 160k, or it might have been 320, I can't remember. This is a long time ago. So I'd significantly improved the amount of disk storage, which was a big bonus because floppy disks were expensive back then. You could pay 70, 80 dollars for a box of 10 floppy disks. So the more you could squeeze onto a disk, the better value you got. Um, I improved the error handling. I included a new format program to format the disks to the higher capacity. What else did I do? It's, I can't remember the stuff because it was so long ago. I added a disk copy program instead of having to use cryptic CPM commands. I, yeah, there we go. Um, all this stuff here and there's compatibility with existing utilities. Things. So that was basically some user documentation. But then the next thing I did was I wrote a word processor. Now word processors were nothing new. Everyone had a word processor on the computer and as I said, WordStar was the most popular word processor of the day on CPM based computers such as the Epson QX10. So, but I thought, no, nah, it's not really good enough because there is, the, the QX10 hardware is so functional, so powerful, has so many extra features that sort of generic word processing doesn't use. I'll write one specifically for the Epson QX10 and I called it Office Writer version one. Look at this version one. And this is the documentation that I wrote when I was creating this piece of software. Now this is, as I say, what is the date on this? I must have a date here somewhere. Um, 1983. 1983. So this is like, what's that? That's like 30 something, 34 years ago I did this. That's a long time ago. It's half a lifetime. Half a lifetime ago I wrote all this stuff when I did my programming. So here we go. Um, this is the manual. Everything backup procedures. Um, it's turning on and starting up. Well, I mean, you know, simple stuff. I One of the things that I really focused on was user documentation. Very important, a trip around the keyboard. Um, this sort of stuff, so it made it really easy for people to use. Um, this is the incomplete manual. Obviously, there's bits like typing a letter, printing your work. I hadn't done those bits on this particular release of the manual. And reference section, here we go. And it was designed, you could use character, uh, control keys as well because it was designed to run on the QX10, but also run on other computers. And reference section. And then the, the bit that's most interesting, if you are a, uh, a geek, is what comes up next. Hang on. And remember, I wrote this completely from scratch. So, find the right bits. Demonstration text. Ah, here we go. Here is the code, or the documentation for some of the code, things like the keyboard polling routine, the status routine, the character, um, display routines. Um, all these different things that from a programming perspective, little chunks of the program, little blocks of the program. So each of those was defined and the parameters were all included here if there were parameters. So it was, documentation was something that's really important when you're writing software. So many programmers, especially back here when a lot of the microcontroller programmers, you know, they just taught themselves to program. So they didn't understand the importance of documentation. So they'd make something work, but when there was a bug or something else, or if you had to maintain their code, it was a nightmare. So I prided myself on doing my documentation. So, and of course, also flow diagrams. Now this is the logic of the program. So all my program flows are documented and then they relate back to other blocks of the program. So all through here, we have a massive flow, flow structure diagrams and things which tell us how the program works. And then, when we come to the crunch, 
here is the program code. And uh, it was 6th of December 1983 I wrote, started writing this code. And those of you today may not recognize what we've got here. This is Z80 assembly code. That's right, it's not C, it's not basic, it's not um, uh, the language of the day, whatever you're using today, C++, no, it's machine code, it's assembly code. So each one of these is an instruction that the assembler converts into, well not there because they just equates, let's go a bit further on, um, into the guts, but here we go. So here are the instructions that tell a computer what to do step by step. This was really heady stuff because remember back then we only had tiny amounts of memory to work with and these days you get a computer that's got 4 gigs or 8 gigs of RAM we're talking with CPM 48 K bytes of RAM not 48 megabytes certainly not 48 gigabytes but 48 K bytes of RAM that's 48,000 bytes of RAM is all you had to play with I mean you want to write a full-blown word processor it gets pretty tricky and also these are really slow processors we're talking about 8-bit processors running at 4 megahertz, that's right, megahertz, not gigahertz, a thousand times slower than today's fast desktop processors. And because they're only 4-bit, sorry, 8-bit, not 64-bit, they only have one-eighth of the data handling for each instruction. So you're looking at incredible 32 times slower, in fact, less, more than 32 times slower. So to get something that's snappy and responsive, you had to use machine code, you had to use assembly code, because high-level languages just wouldn't produce fast enough code, and they'd use too much memory to do it. So... This is all the source code for this, this particular uh, word processing thing. And as you can see, when necessary, it's documented, the, line, the code is documented, and there's heaps of it, there's heaps of code. And so I wrote this from scratch, and it was also a very successful product. A lot of people used it. It's a great alternative to the generic WordStar and other word processors that were often bundled with computers because it made full use of the computer's functionality, the extra hardware that the computer had and everything like that. So yeah, it was it was great times. I really enjoyed, really enjoyed this uh, this project and all the projects I worked on back then, actually. So that's what I used to do. And it was a real nostalgia trip finding this folder because it reminded me just how much work went into some of this stuff. Um, although interestingly enough, the QX10 BIOS rewrite, it's about 8K of machine code or assembly code. It took me, I think, a weekend, just one weekend. To completely rewrite the bias of a desktop or the most sophisticated desktop computer on the market at the time it's kind of good uh, but that was all nighters these were when I, this was when i was young and i'd live on pizza and coca-cola and i could work for 48 hours at a stretch not today i'm afraid i really notice the effects of age it really pisses me off but there you go that's uh, a little look into the past of what i used to do some 34 years ago long long time ago Ooh, but isn't that a nice folder? Yes, I did have a TRS-80 Model 2. I had a Model 1, a Model 2, a Model 3, and a Model 4. Did I have a Model 4? I can't remember. 1, 2, 3. No, I think I only had 1, 2, and 3. And they were great computers. Such a shame that Radio Shack is now history. I think someone else is using the name or something's happening, but it's not Radio Shack like we used to know. So, a little trip down memory lane. If you've got questions or comments, anything you'd like to know about this particular piece of code, uh, or what I was doing back then, then please put them in the uh, place provided by YouTube. I'll do my best to answer them. In the meantime, thank you for watching, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. Bye for now.